Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, do me a favor, everyone. Let's just give um, our worship team a round of applause. They work tirelessly, yeah? And uh, I appreciate them. You know, that song, uh, Where I See the Cross, I See Freedom, I, I feel like as we were singing that, um, and I'm just going to go off script, if that's cool. Um, what's, what else is new? Um, I feel like some of you in here are bound, as we were singing that, bound by the need for healing. Whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it may be. So if that's you, we're going to do something this morning. I'm going to ask you to be bold before we get into the message. I'm going to ask you to be bold because I believe what that song just said, when I see the cross, I'll see freedom. And I believe this morning that God desires to bring forth healing in your life, right? The cross is a representation of healing, healing from sin, but healing from every ailment that sin brings forth. And so if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you if that's emotional, relational, or physical pain or hurt, and you want freedom from that, I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. We're going to believe and pray over that right now before we even jump into John. We're going to believe that we're going to take the word of what we just worshiped and put it into practice right now. So I'm going to ask you to be bold and stand up right now. Thank you. Thank you for your courage this morning. I appreciate that. I believe this. I believe that when we take a stand and say, God, we need that scripture comes into place. It's, I am so um, prepared to give you that which you need. And so I'm going to ask you right now, just extend your hands and believe in this, and I'm going to pray over you, and I believe today that God wants to set you free. When you see that cross, you see freedom, and that's from anything in your life. And so, Father, I believe what we just sang. Would you, would you as the, the, this congregation, this community is standing, for those that are in need of healing, relational, physical, financial, spiritual, whatever it may be, Holy Spirit, would you work today? Would you bring forth the freedom that your scripture promises? By the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. Father, the emotional baggage, the relational baggage that has been holding us down, that has been binding our sense of freedom in the cross, today we renounce the enemy's grip on that. And we say where he is, where God is, nothing will be bound because there is freedom in him. So would you heal those that are hurting this morning? For those that are in physical pain and desiring a physical healing, Father, right now as they walk out these doors later on this afternoon, or as they sit in this seat right now, God, would you move your hand upon them and would there be freedom from ailment? And so, Father, we believe that today. We, we sing what we sing and we extend our hands and our, in faith that you can do that which we just sang that you can bring forth freedom. And so, Father, we believe that today by the Holy Spirit's work. Would you move today, Lord? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. All that are standing and you have the faith to believe that today, would you just shout and say amen? Amen, amen. amen, amen. All right, let's give God a round of applause this morning. All right. Not at all part of John chapter 3, but that's all right. How many of you have ever been lost? Like driving lost? Men, do not admit it. Men, if you admit it, you're going to be stuck with admitting that forever. All right, so before there was MapQuest, before there was Waze, before there was Google Maps and my little app telling me where to go on my little car's computer, for those of us that are older, we had something called the Rand McNally. <laughs> Anybody know who Rand McNally is? Rand McNally was that big book of maps that your dad opened up and wasn't even on the right page trying to find where he was going as he's driving. So, right, they say text and driving is bad today. We were doing this in driving. <laughs> right? So I, I got lost once. <laughs> no, I admit it, I got lost once. Uh, my wife and I were driving somewhere and I got lost once and and I said to her, uh, she reminded me, I don't think we're going the right way. And I reminded her, you're not Rand McNally. <laughs> and she was right. We were going the wrong way. 
but I wasn't going to hear it. So I admit that I was lost once. So you know the feeling of what it's like to be driving and not knowing where you're going, right? It's kind of like this video. Here, check this out. Joker wants to race. Don't race. That's ridiculous. All right, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Put your window down! He wants something. Uh, he's probably drunk. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. <laughs> what a moron. You're going in the wrong direction. You're going to kill somebody. That's a good clip. How many of you have done that? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. I love that movie. They're going the wrong way. We all can relate to what it's like to drive somewhere and go the wrong way. We're going to find out in John chapter 3 as we kind of jump into the passage. We've been going through the book of John. We've gone through John 1, John 2. Last week we were talking about the wedding feast. This week we're going to jump into John 3 and we're going to meet a guy named Nicodemus. Now, John chapter 3 and the first part of John chapter 3 is all about Nicodemus, but you're going to find out perhaps something about Nicodemus that you and I can relate to. We're going to discover over the next course of this few minutes here that Nicodemus thought he was going the right direction, but in essence was going the wrong direction. Very clearly going the wrong direction. And he had to make a course adjustment. adjustment. We're, as we jump into text, we're going to find four truths this morning. The first truth is Nicodemus asks Jesus a question. The second truth we're going to find out is that Jesus gives a very hard to understand answer. The person, Nicodemus, doesn't really get it, and so guess what Jesus does? He gives an even harder answer to understand. So, here we go. John chapter 3, open up your Bible. Hello online, we're excited you're here with us this morning. We're going to have a lot of fun as we go through the scripture. But here we go, John chapter 3. Now, we first of all understand it was after dark one evening, a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus. Now, I don't know what they called Nicodemus in those days. Uh, I don't think they probably called him Nicodemus. I, I would rather give him a more modern name like Nick or, or Nico or D-Money or Nicky D or something like that. So for this morning, we're not going to call him Nicodemus because I want him to relate to you. We're just going to call him Nick. No offense, Nick. Got you. Got you. So Nicodemus, Right away, we understand this. He was a religious leader, a Pharisee. So the first things we understand about Nicodemus is that he was an elite person. He was a scholar. He was a Pharisee, which meant that he was the religious of the religious. He kept the law above the law. The second thing we understand is that he was part of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin was a 70-member council that was basically the ruling council. And they believed in two things. They believed in upholding religion and law. Okay, so we understand that Nicodemus was a lawyer. He was a well-respected. Matter of fact, if you were in that day in a chariot accident, as you drove down the pathway, you would call Demas and Demas. That's the type of guy this guy was. <laughs> Demas and Demas. You would drive and see billboards. If you're hurt, call Demas and Demas. He was respected. He was a lawyer. I love Demas and Demas. 
And I find it interesting that John records a little bit of this conversation with him. So here we go. John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish ruler who was a Pharisee. A man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish council. He came to Jesus at night saying, Rabbi. So right away we understand something about Nicodemus. He understands Jesus is different. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. I love the fact that it's rabbi, but what's the next word? We. You see, Jesus had already influenced enough people that they understand there's something different about him already. We know that you're a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform the signs you are doing if God was not with him. So Nick comes at night. Why does Nick come at night? Why? Because the Pharisees were at war with Jesus. He's basically saying to the Pharisees, everything you're doing, guess what you're doing? You're going the wrong way. He was an enemy to them. You see, they were ruled by rules, tradition, and a way of life, and, and they had a monopoly on this whole deal. And Jesus comes right to the scene, and he says this, you're wrong. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. You ever had a conversation with somebody, and, and you started off, and it's a good conversation, and their first words out of their mouth are, you're wrong? How does that make you feel? Not so hot, right? So here's Nicodemus. He's, a, he's an in, uh, intelligent person. He's a very well-respected person. He's, he's held the letter of the law. He's got a monopoly on religion. And he comes to Jesus at night because he was a threat to the way everyone was living. And so I often wonder if Nicodemus comes at night because he's either worried that everybody else is going to see what's about to happen in his conversation, or... Or maybe he was watching Jesus all day, and finally as it became nighttime, he was intrigued by what he had seen. And so he kind of sheepishly comes to Jesus. You see, sometimes what was happening is Jesus was a threat to their way of life. And Nicodemus wanted to figure out what was going on. Let me just maybe make this little statement this morning. Maybe Jesus has been a threat to the way you live. And maybe you're a little bit intrigued by him, but you know that he's a problem because the problem in your life is that he wants you to maybe do it differently. We're going to find out what happened with Nicodemus. You see, Nicodemus was about religious practice. Jesus was about life change. Let me just ask you this morning, it's a simple question. Is he a threat to the way you live? Not your whole life, but to aspects and areas of your life. You see, because what we're going to understand about Nicodemus is that was the biggest issue, is he was a threat to his life. One thing I love about Jesus, if, if, if you're looking for the truth, he will always give it to you. He never sugarcoats the truth. Matter of fact, Matthew 7, verse 7, 8 says this, Ask and you shall what? Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For anyone who asks shall receive who finds. And anyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You see, that's what Jesus does. If you're looking for the truth, he's going to give it to you. And so Nicodemus, in some senses, is looking for the truth. He knows what he knows, but he knows that there's still something missing in his life, and so he's looking for this truth, and so uh, he starts off this question, conversation with Jesus. By the way, I love how he starts this conversation with Jesus. We all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident that God is with you. If you ever want to make friends, do me a favor. Start off a conversation like this. Start off like, hey man, you're awesome. I love you. I've been, I've been watching your, 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 your podcast. I've been listening to your podcast. I follow you on Instagram. Like, I can't believe at the things you're doing. Man, last chapter, you know, I was at that wedding. You made water into wine. Man, ooh, so good. I love local organic, right? That's what was going on here. He was like a little fanboy to Jesus. He was a huge fan. He's basically saying, I know who you are, and I love what you're doing but something ain't right. I know you're the real deal. I can't deny it, but something's not right. He comes seeking the truth, and Jesus, I love Jesus, he tells him the truth. He says this. In verse 3, he says, Jesus says, very truly, I tell you the truth. I tell you what? What is he looking for? Truth. Jesus turns around, he gives him the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Like, Jesus cuts through the chit-chat. He's not like, well, hey, man, Nick, thanks for talking to me about what, how good I'm doing. I really appreciate that you like the wine. Matter of fact, hey, you're part of the Sanhedrin, man. You guys are killing it over there. I love what you guys are doing. No, no, no. He doesn't boast about himself. He just comes out flat with the truth. 
Wouldn't it be awesome if we can start all conversations just straight up, no chit-chat? Some of you have that personality. Some of you only have one friend. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Listen to what Nicodemus says, verse 4. What do you mean? How can someone be old and born again? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter the second time into their mother's womb to be born. Dude, talk about literal. Right? I'm not sure, based upon this argument, if I'm ever hiring Demas and Demas to represent me. Like, come on. Nicodemus has all sorts of problems with what Jesus said, not just um, theologically, but physically he has problems with what Jesus just said. He's like, I don't get what you're asking here. Logistically, how is this going to work? I'm pretty sure my mom's not going to be on this plan with you. Jesus breaks it down. He, he gives it, again, he gives an answer. Verse 5 through 8. I love this next passage. He says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by the saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with the spirit. So what Jesus just said to Nicodemus is, man, all your practice has been great. All your, uh, all your religious life has been great, but guess what? Being good is not good enough right now. And he says this, he says this. He goes on, he says, he rocks him to the core. Nicodemus is, is finding his paradigm of what he thought was to be saved and to be intimate with God. He's finding his paradigm for the first time shattered into pieces because of the statement that Jesus brought. Not only did Jesus say, you will not be in the kingdom, but he even says, you can't even see the kingdom. He drills to his heart, he shatters his pride, his power, his prestige, his comfort, his paradigm of who God is at this one conversation at night destroys his paradigm of, of God. You see, you've got to remember this. This is really important. Nick was a church-going man. He wasn't some sinful man that's out doing crazy things. You know, Nick actually devoted himself to God. He was a church-going man. He had memorized Scripture, the first five books of the Bible, because if you're a Pharisee, you have to remember, uh, memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Two of them we typically skip over, right? Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy. <laughs> he tithed, he prayed, he believed in God. He, but the problem is, what happened with Nicodemus is his faith was disconnected from his heart. It never changed necessarily the way he lived. He lived by religious law and religious practice, but it didn't transform his heart. Let me just ask you this this morning. Has your faith transformed your heart? Or is it just an action as an additive to part of your life? You see, some of us are more like Nicodemus than we like to admit. How often do we follow the rules, but we don't have a relationship? You see, I've always said it this way, and I believe this with my children. By the way, I'm a little tired this morning. I was up all night because my daughter went to her, my last daughter went to her first homecoming with some boy. <laughs> oh, you laugh. I'm a little tired from that. But I've always said this regarding my kids, and I believe it's the same thing in our relationship with Jesus. Rules, following the rule, without a relationship, will one day lead to rebellion. Think about that in your walk with God. When we follow the rule of saying, okay, God, I'll do it your way, this way, this way, this way, by the script, so to speak, but my heart isn't in it because it hasn't been changed by the relationship, guess where you find yourself eventually? In rebellion from what God desires us to do because you're not emotionally, heartfully connected to God. You see, I think there's a little bit of Pharisee in all of us this morning, a little spiritual pride, maybe showmanship. We think we got it all together. At least we like to appear that we do. Let me just dispel the biggest rumor of all time. Nobody has it all together. Nobody. Now, you may look at people and be like, oh, man, I wish I were them. Guess what? We never compare down, do we? We never compare down. Whether that's with our, uh, our physical life. How many of you look at somebody's junky car and you're driving a nice car and you're like, man, I wish I had that car. Or how about your house? 
You drive past somebody in a, in a trailer and, you're, and you got a nice house and you're like, man, I wish I had that house. No, what we do is we compare up, don't we? And so it is with our faith. We do the same thing. We look at other people and we think, they must have it all together spiritually because of what they say and what they do and how committed they are. Let me tell you what. We don't compare ourselves to the least of thee. We compare ourselves to think we people who have the most of thee. And let me tell you, nobody has the most except Jesus. So nobody has it all together. Even Billy does not have it all together. <laughs> Amen? Listen, if I'm honest, there's many times I find myself redoing religious activity thinking I'm serving the Lord. But later I realize I was serving my own ego. My own pride. And I find myself guilty that way sometimes. Because my heart's not in it. And see, that's what a Pharisee does. And the more I look at the Pharisees, the more I realize that might be me more than I'd like to admit. You see, Jesus was getting at something totally different than following religious and law. He was getting at a heart issue with Nicodemus. I love Nick's reply to what Jesus just said. Verse 9. Huh? That's in the scripture. That's, that's in the scripture right there, huh? Like he's asked him once already, and Jesus, and Jesus is like, you got to be reborn. He's like, I don't really understand that. How can I? I'd have to go back to my mother's womb. So he asks the same question again, and I told you in the beginning, Jesus gives an answer the first time that's confusing. He gives an answer the second time that's even more confusing. So this is where we find ourselves with Nick, huh? How can that be? Nicodemus asked. By the way, that version will be on sale in the, lo in the lobby after church. <laughs> Jesus replied, you are a res well-respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? Come on, man. I thought you were smart. I thought you got it. You got the billboards. You got the lawyer's deal. You got, you got the credit in the street from everybody. You're part of the, the ruling council. You're part of the, the Pharisee council. You are the man. You are legit. How come you not understand what I'm talking to you about? If you're supposed to be the great teacher of Israel, how come you don't understand what I'm talking to you about? Huh? So he goes on, verse 11. I assure you, well, tell you, what we've known, what we've seen, and yet you still don't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me, well then, I'm about to, uh, to tell you about earthly things. How is it even possible you will believe in the things of heaven? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man, so he's speaking of himself, has come down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake and the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up again. And everyone who believes in me, in him, sometimes talks in third person, which I'm going to try doing, will have eternal life. You see, what Jesus was doing, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, or Nicky, Nicky D, about something he'd understand. You see, because that story about what he just talked about, about Moses lifting up a staff or a golden serpent staff, was actually found in, in, in Old Testament. It was something that he would have memorized before. You see, he's not using a story that Nick doesn't understand. Matter of fact, in, in Numbers chapter 21, it's a story of Moses. And what was happening is the, 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 the tribe of Israel was being so sinful that God had said, sent serpents down from a mountain to come and bite and, and infect all these Israelites who were guilty of sin, infect them with venom to kill them. And so what he said to Moses is in Numbers 21, read, the, read it if you want, because this is how cool Jesus is. He's using something that Nicodemus would have already known and memorized to trap him. And he says this, uh, so, so what would happen then is if Moses, if he held his staff up and the people stopped looking at what was happening to them beaten, bitten by these serpents, if Moses held his staff up high, they would have been saved and healed from the venom of the serpents. That's, what, that's what the story in Numbers 21. So Jesus is using the same idea. And he says this, he says, if, if, if they, if, I am just like that. They had to lift their eyes to be saved. And guess what you have to do, Nicodemus? Guess what he's telling us that we have to do? We have to lift our eyes to the one who can save us. He, he's fulfilling this Old Testament story with who he is because when he was on the cross, everyone had to look at him. And he says this, he says, by my being lifted up, so shall you be healed and set free. It's exactly what Christ does. Just as Moses lifted the staff, for those who are saved and healed, Christ has been lifted on high. And guess what? For we can be saved and healed. 
Because to be honest, and this is a crazy thing, we've all been bitten by the serpent and stung with sin. And death is its sentence. You see, we've all been bitten by the serpent. Back in the garden, this is a reference to that. If you, this is why I love the Bible, because it just goes one upon another upon another. It's a reference back to the serpent in the garden who laid forth the foundation to be stung by sin for the first time. So Jesus has given this, this dialogue about this whole idea that Nick might just understand what he's saying. This is what Jesus says to Nick. We've all been bitten. We all have been given death sentence. But I have come to set you free. I have come so that death sentence, you can be born anew. It's like this. This is a great example. I bought an Apple computer about 10 years ago because I was tired of Windows viruses. Anybody relate to Windows computer viruses? Yup. Every time I'd open my computer, it would have to update on my Windows. Billy still uses a Windows, which I, I, I'm not understanding that. May the devil come out of him for that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? I switched to Mac. I'm a Mac guy. I'm a proud Mac man. I'll, I'll, I'll say it out loud. But every couple weeks, I get a notice on my computer that I'm not really happy about. And it says this, critical update required. That's why I bought you in the first place. Do this or you're going to lose everything. But here's the problem. You see, if I click that little convenient button that says update, here's my problem. It's going to shut everything else down. It's going to shut my entire computer down, and I don't like to do that because i got to reboot the system, and rebooting the system, it's annoying. It takes some time, some, some long, and everything I'm working on eventually has to be closed to the crash. But my computer keeps reminding me all the time to update, and it's actually a gift. See, I, I'm, I'm falling in love with my Mac because my Mac loves me. It puts a window that says, do this or this is going to happen. My computer loves me enough to tell me, I'm going to crash on you. But eventually, inevitably, I'm going to have to restart and reinstall, or I'm going to crash. And that's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus right now. He's saying, Nick, you need an update, because the virus that you have, it's going to crash your life. If you're living in a Windows world, baby, and it's a Mac world now, Nicodemus. Thank you, amen. <laughs> and it's true. Think about this for a second. We have a virus in our system. And there's an update. And the problem is, most of us, if we're truly honest, we do what I do. I look at that update and I say, I don't want to close tabs of my life because that reminds me that that's going to take some work. And I like when I have all the tabs of my life under my control. And what you're saying is if I close some of these tabs and install the update, that, that it's going to look different from this point on. And that's what Nicodemus was struggling with Jesus. Nicodemus is saying, if I accept you, if I hear what you're saying, if I actually cognitively, spiritually understand what you're saying, life is going to be different for me. And I don't know if I like that. Let me ask you this question this morning. Do you realize that God loves you and he sends a little warning box to you to pop up that says today is a critical update. You better install it now. Because the truth of the matter is, and I watched it happen this morning, relatably, I believe there's many in here that their life's about to crash. And you know what it's like. You know the virus is in there. You know that, that things aren't going the way you desired. It's not working as efficiently. Your life is not, is not um, working without problems anymore. And, and there's times where things are a little slow. And there's times where things are shutting down. And there's emotionally, you're struggling in life. And let me tell you about this. There's a guy named Jesus Christ who says, I want to give you an update. Because the things you're doing, the, the things you're living, how you're living, the tabs you're opening, it's not working for you anymore. And you need an updated life. But if you're like me, I'm like, why? I don't want to start the whole thing again. There must be a different way. I mean, you can imagine Nicodemus saying that, right? He's saying, listen, I know the law. I'm respecting this community. And you're telling me i got to do something completely different? And Jesus is like, yep. I'm telling you something you got to do completely different. 
And, and, and Nick is like, but, but you don't know who I am in this community. That's why I have to come to you at night, because if I came to you during the day, people would realize, oh, uh, this is a problem. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know who you are. Believe me, Nick. I know who you are. You see, what I realize is this, just like Nicodemus or Nikki, what I've come to realize is a lot of people, church-going people like Nick, who believe in Jesus, who believe in God, I should say, but have never been born again. They've never submitted their lives to him. So what does it mean? This is the ultimate question. What does it mean to be born again? Because that's what Nick is asking Jesus right here. What does it mean? What do you mean, huh? Verse 9. Let me tell you what it means to be born again. It's a simple thing. It means that you die. It means that your way of living is dead. It means that your understanding of what is right and wrong over your life, what tabs you can control to be open, it means that they all get shut down and something gets restarted and installed. It means that you've given up your life for Christ. It means that all your actions, your decisions, your trust now rests in the update of Christ in your life. You see, a new heart speaks of something that is alive. With love, with new desires, the old has passed away. And I know that some of you here, because I've had many conversations, I know that some of you here are longing to be alive again. Let me let you a secret this morning. You cannot have new life when you hold on to death. Maybe it's, maybe it's the death of a relationship that needs to occur. Maybe it's the death of, of your control of your life. Maybe it's the death of your finances, your relationships. Maybe it's the death of, of your ideologies of who you think God is and the assumptions that you've made about God. You can't have new life if you're holding on to death. Matter of fact, the football verse, John 3.16, says this, For this is how God loved the world. He gave. His only one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. That word have in that passage is not in the future. That word have in this, in this passage is a present tense word that you may have eternal life now. What does that mean to have eternal life now? It means that I live with a hope that is not under my control anymore. That's what that means. That this relationship doesn't begin in heaven, it begins now because I can live with hope. Verse 17, John 17, 317. God sent his son into the world not to judge, but to save it through him. See, here's the truth. Heaven is not our default destination. Heaven is a detour destination. You see, because sin came into the world and said, this is your destination. Separation from God. But Christ comes in the world and he says, through you being born new, guess what? We're going to detour you off the path of destruction. We're going to give you a new life. And he says this, the road is narrow, few find it. And Jesus is saying to this guy, but I want to show you how, Nick. See, I didn't come to the world to condemn it. I came to save you. And if we're honest, many people feel like God's out just to get them. And you're right, he is out to get you, but not in the way you might think. He wants to get you because he's tired of being separated from you. Now remember this. Nick was a church-going Bible memorizing, faithful prayer, and tither, and Jesus is saying to him, yeah, but you're separated from me, buddy. It's not the action that changes everything. It's your heart, it's position that changes everything. Because when your heart is in it, your prayers mean something. When your heart is in it, your sacrifice means something. When your heart is in it, your tithe means something. When your heart is in it, your prayers are effective. Scripture says, uh, the righteous, prayers of the righteous man accomplish much. It doesn't say prayers of the faithful religious man accomplish much. And so that's what Jesus is saying to Nick. You see, I wonder that night. I wonder that what Nick thought that night when all his ideas of God, religion, law, when they all came crashing down in a simple conversation with Jesus. And that night he realized that he was going the wrong way. And in that meeting, one honest conversation, Nick's life totally changed. And I wonder what would happen today or tonight at our worship night if you actually had that same kind of honest conversation with Jesus. And let me tell you what, it probably frustrated the heck out of Nick. Not understanding, not getting a clear answer, like break it down for me, preschool. What do I need to do, Jesus? And he just says, you've got to be born again, Nick. 
And he says the same thing to you and me. You just got to be born again. What does that mean? It means that I have now given my life over to you. And I know, and I'm not condemning or judging any manner because I am the least of thee to do that. But I am certain because I understand it in my own life. I don't know that every area of my life has been born new. Has been born again. There's still parts of the tabs of my life that are open and underneath my control. And Jesus is saying, no, listen, the update, I am it. I will make it a better life for you. An upgrade because, Nick, you're going the wrong way. May I be so frank to say this? Maybe there's some of you in this room that's going the wrong way. Maybe you're here, but it's just out of practice, which is a good thing. But maybe you're going the wrong way, and you know it in your heart. You know it. You see, this is not the last time in closing that we see Nick show up, and I love how Nick shows finally up again. You see, he shows up one other time, two other times, really, in the Scripture of John. He shows up once, and for the first time, he's actually defending Jesus to the Sanhedrin, to the people he's a member of. He's like, no, 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 no. What, what has this guy really done? That's the second time we see Nick. And the third time we see Nick, it's really interesting that John puts it in there. And, and I love how he addresses him. John 19, 38. Nick shows up. The end of the book of John. Upon Jesus' death, Joseph came to take the body away. With him came Nicodemus. And I love what he's called from that point on. The man, next, next, next verse please, I don't know if we have it, 39. He's called this. The man who would come to Jesus at night. That's the label he's given the rest of the scripture. He came with Nicodemus, the man, quote unquote, who would come to Jesus at night. And he brought 75 pounds of perfumed anointment made with myrrh and aloe. You see, he just didn't come at night. Now he came to give all he could because he realized finally who Jesus was. He came at night. What a description. The man who would come at night in darkness. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're in a dark night. Do what Nicodemus did. All he's known for from that point on is not representing chariot drivers and car accidents. He's represented and only known for one thing. He came to Jesus. That's it. That's the story of Nicodemus. A guy who, who was a worried, could not understand what Jesus was doing in his life, frustrated by Jesus a little bit in his conversation. Let me tell you what, there's been many times in my life I've been frustrated by what Jesus is saying to me. Because I don't like it. I think that's why Nicodemus had these problems of wondering why and what was going on. But then, he's known by a phrase. What a great phrase. Imagine if that was the phrase that was over your life. Here comes Travis. He's known for coming to Jesus. Matt. Matt, well, he's known. He, he's the man who came to Jesus. Could you imagine? Mace. She's the one who came to Jesus. If that was said about me, that's good enough, huh? If that was said about you, guess what? That's good enough. That's the best news it could be. And so today, you know, we got this worship night coming tonight at 6 p.m. And, you know, we're going to get into the presence of God and seek Him and pray and worship. And I can't wait for that. I love those nights. I would encourage all of you to come out tonight. Because maybe you need an update. Maybe you're going the wrong way. Let me share with you what I know. Your view of God may change, but the word of God never changes. And tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get in the presence and the word of God in worship and prayer. And he never changes because he knows the right way to go. And so I want to pray for you this morning, if that's you. If you're going the wrong way and you know it, listen. That's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's here to guide you and to convict us and to bring to light in areas of our life that, if we're honest, we'll say, yeah, Holy Spirit, I am going the wrong way in that area of my life. That tab is under my control, and I need an update in that area. If that's you, I want to pray with you right now. So close your eyes for a second. Father, I know that there's many people here who are like Nick. 
and including myself. Father, that there's areas of my life that are going the wrong way. And just like that video, um, you're sending signals all day long. You're sending, you're sending um, the Holy Spirit's conviction in my life and in our lives that's telling us, man, that area is going the wrong way. It needs to be updated. You need better directions. And I want to give them to you. And so if that's you this morning, I'd encourage you to come tonight and get an update. I'd encourage you to pray these words maybe, like Nick. I just need to come to you. I just need to come to you. And lay down what I have and honor you with it. And maybe some of you in this room have never uh, known Jesus at all. And uh, you know you're going the wrong way. Not just areas of your life, but your whole life has gone the wrong way. And you're in the night, and your soul feels it. Jesus just says a simple thing. Man, you just got to be born again. I'm going to bring the life to you now. And if that's you this morning, I just pray a simple prayer with you. And it's this easy deal. It says, God, if that's you, just say these words after me. God, I'm going the wrong way. I give you my life. Show me the right way. That's it. I surrender my heart to you. So Father, today we come before you. And I know that everyone in this room has something in common with me. Is that none of us have it all together. And that we need you to show us the right way as you showed Nicodemus. Would you help us, Father? Would you, would you change our assumptions and, and maybe our limitations of what we put on you like Nick did, that you couldn't do that? Because maybe there's areas in our lives... God, that, that you are saying, take the limits off of what I can do for you. Take the assumptions and throw them out and let me birth new life in you. Because you're clinging to death. So Father, thank you. Thank you for the story of Nicodemus in John 3. Thank you that the guy was going the wrong way and you showed him the right way because you've shown me the right way. And Father, for those that are here, that maybe they're going the wrong way, today would be the day that you show them the right way. And we follow your word. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for the hope that is found in new life. The celebration that is found in new life. And I'm reminded that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. If you need prayer of any type, if you uh, know you've got an area of your life that's going the wrong direction, I'm going to encourage you to come up front. We've got some people who are going to be here to pray for you. And I'm going to encourage you tonight at 6 p.m. What time? 6 p.m. I didn't hear that. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Come join us back for a great evening. Amen? Have a blessed day. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to have an opportunity to connect with you and give you a free gift for joining us today. Or if this isn't your first time, but you're ready to get connected, go ahead and send me an email and let me know how we can best serve you. We have life groups, both live and virtual, classes and resources to help you live your life in complete freedom. And you know what? If you're ready for the full on-campus experience, you can reach out to us via email as well, and we will get you connected with an opportunity to check us out and meet our church. Thank you so much for watching and have a blessed week.